Hello there. My name is Melanie and with me today is Noreen Dean Dresser. Noreen is an artist featured at the Women's Caucus of Arts exhibit at the Alpha Art Gallery. Uh, welcome and how are you doing today? I'm excellent. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Okay. So just to get started, um, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, how did you get into art and your own, you know, kind of specific creative process? I think I was always that child that had a keen sense visually aware mm -hmm. and um, what I wanted to mention, I guess, when I, your questions were very useful and it made me reflect. And uh, I learned to draw by, absor by observing a woman named Ma Parker, um, originally from Cleveland. Uh, Ma Parker was a master horsewoman woman of the 19th and 20th century. Um, she had actually started off in birth in, uh, in Plainsfield, New Jersey, but had been, became very skilled. Her grandmother and her mother ran a, uh, an equestrian school that was quite renowned. Mm -hmm. And she then became a, a major trick writer. Bill Cody noticed that and hired her. She did that circuit. She met her husband. Parker, who was a Bronco rider, and the two of them broke off, did vaudeville. She came to Cleveland in 1929 and stayed and wound up having Parker's ranch. And so when I was a kid, I would, she took all of that and made that really real for us. She could teach any form of equestrianship and she drew beautifully. And I would sit and watch her draw. And then she allowed me to study, you know, if you try. And then, um, so it was that. It was this, this magical place of making horses dance across the page wow. and catching uh, nuance of movement and feeling. Hmm. Um, so she taught me to first to see and then to draw. And that stayed with me. I kept journals. Um, you know, kept moving forward in my life. I went to Antioch College as an undergraduate and there nature, urban planning and theological questions uh, as to our body politic really merged for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I went into art. I mean, art was a place where those kinds of concerns um, could happen. And the other thing uh, that really moved me, I remember when I was 16 was seeing a Barnett Newman painting museum and I found myself crying and not knowing why mm. it just moved me that much wow. and that of course then you know went to college and I learned to paint and study painting and drawing so that's where that all comes in I think it's important for these times in that so many people move through vast amounts of of visual information on iPhones, iPads, iPhone, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. But that's not the same as looking. Mm -hmm. And so to slow down, I think art still has a, a deeper um, validity in the 21st century because it's to slow you down, to make you look, and to make you consider what you're looking at is right. important. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, actually, I have a follow-up question if you don't. I'm wondering, like, obviously, like, I mean, I know art museums are starting to open up a bit and galleries are starting to open a bit, but did you notice that kind of lack of that slow reading and, like, consideration? Have you have you noticed that more prominently with the pandemic and everything, not being able to kind of experience that same thing? Well, I, you know, I'm an artist. I have a studio, so I'm doing my own work, so I have mm -hmm. not, in that sense, missed it, but I am aware of getting people um, not to look at my art in two inches by two inch format. Mm, gotcha. <laughs> it loses something in translation, even with good right. photography. It loses something in translation. <laughs> but anyway. <Okay>. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. Okay, so. great. Um, I, when I was looking through uh, some of your pieces, I noticed that there's a lot of tension between kind of the individual and the community. Uh -huh. And I wondered, um, you know, why, why did you choose to kind of make that maybe sort of a focus or a focal point of some of your pieces? That is a theme that runs through my work. Um, one of the thing, one of the primary themes of my work across all my bodies of work is really, uh, I'm concerned with ethical questions. Hmm. And one of the things um, that is profound for me is a sense of self-agency. 
that we as individuals make decisions and then they accumulate into various systems from political to uh, areas of field of study, of discipline, all kinds of elaborate systems come from that. But there's still a component of individual agency. So if we look out for an example on our environmental crisis, we won't get there by changing the law, though the laws need to be changed. Right. We also need to examine our own lives and how we use plastic. Um, you know, because the demand will stop, or if the demand changes, then systems change. So there's that, that's just life. I mean, I think that uh, it's very important for me to kind of accept individual agency within a communal framework. Yeah, actually, that, that's an interesting segue to one of my other questions, which was, well, this is, I wrote these questions before even this kind of came up, but in terms of, I noticed, especially in this piece, there's a lot of kind of a theme of burning or fire or and I wondered and obviously now with like the fires in California and we're seeing those huge effects right now with the sky turning a different color and that it's it's much more kind of less symbolic very very uh, literal kind of now there's this burning um why why did why did that come to you in like your moment like what what made you make that decision to kind of use burning or, or fire like what 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 was that like I have used fire at various times in my work over the years, but okay. for this particular series, which really centers in COVID-19, so what, you know, it's called Crowdsourcing 2020, right. um, with a nod to you guys who all, <laughs> you know, um, do that kind of thing. But also to that's when I'm really doing the study of, of is the Psalms, and so this ancient text Right. You know, if you think about the people who are dying, you know, everywhere across Judo and, Christi and Christian traditions, mm -hmm. often, you know, the Psalm of David is read, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, there's a sense of comfort with that. Mm -hmm. um, often when Jews and Jewish are, are distressed, we will read the Psalms. Okay. Um, so there's that that sense of it. But the other sense is, is that these ancient poems truly speak to our own time, I think. Mm -hmm. Asking those fundamental questions about, you know, what do we serve? Sure. So on and so forth. Um, but in terms of, you know, the COVID-19 breakout, I think fire, fire is a force beyond control. Mm -hmm. uh, is elemental and it's elusive. Mm. You know, it's, if you ever watched a fire, it's always moving, it's there, it's not, it's gas, you know. Right. Um, it's about being and none. Mm -hmm. It will totally destroy. Um, I've seen wildfires, I know what those, those homes are nothing. It will burn through everything, that kind of intense heat. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So it's purity and destruction. Oh. And it's been used in both those capacities, the eternal flame for John F. Kennedy's grave to, um, you know, to the mass destruction, you know, the fear, you know, when people are angry, they burn, you know. Yeah. Hmm. So um, it was perfect. So the process of making these pieces were um, twine that were rolled, you know, literally rolled. There you go. Okay. Um, that were rolled out in circles mm -hmm. across the span of Arches paper. And then the matches are inserted in those circles mm -hmm. in a random, you know. And then when it's lit, the fire moves the twine and the circles. Of course, I'm manipulating some of that. I mean, it can move the fire a little bit, but it's too hot for me to. Right. Don't touch that match. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so there's an element of the matches falling out burned. Hmm. The patterns that are responding to, you know what I mean? So there's always extreme, you've seen these from this extreme graphic rendering. Mm -hmm. This element beyond its control. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the compositional dynamic. Did you, when you were, 
was this process, did you kind of, how did you come up with this process? Did, was it something that you just were inspired by and you just did it? Or was it kind of experimenting? Like how did you come up with the twine and the, and the fires, something you've done a lot before? It's just, um, I've worked before like with drawings and uh, rendering things and then, you know, burning the edges or burning into things or so on. But this one, I really wanted to, um, they were layered so that the wood panel was the first major fire. That's out in the, in the back, you know, mm -hmm. that major burning through and then, you know, for the randomness of the, of the wood panel. But the paper um, sheets, you know, they're on a whole sheet. Um, that just comes out. And if you know that Arches paper, it's just, they're beautiful. But, you know, that thick kind of cotton. Um, and then it was like, you know, the twine, I untwined onto it. And then I thought about the matches and the randomness of it and wanted to group them in these, the match. I've sort of started moving towards the stanzas of the Psalms as different aspects of human nature. So, like in Psalm 1, it opens with, uh, Lord, and that can be anything as you conceive it to be. It can be cosmos or being or whatever, if you wish me to say being. How many are my foes, many who rise up against me, many who say of my life, no rescue for him through. And you are a shield for me, my glory who lifts them up my head. So it's that cry out, I think when I thought about those exhausted medical workers. Hmm. Okay, yeah. You know, all that is that, that primordial cry that happens. Hmm. It's fear and terror. I, I also noticed beyond just fire in general, um, that nature also has kind of come up in your work. Uh, and I wondered if you wanted to speak about a, a bit about that relationship and why, you know, that serves as sort of inspiration or a connection to your artwork. Well, well, it's important to me because I believe right now we're in a war against nature. Mm -hmm. We live in a highly technological society with the markets. We now have crossed the threshold where more than 50% of the population lives in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that kind of thing. And we ignore, or we see nature as something we can consume. Mm -hmm. right? We right. consume wood, we consume resources, you know, whatever. And we are and somehow have made ourselves in our ivory towers or glass towers obscure to the fact of the cost of that. Okay. And so that war against nature to me is, you know, problematic. So nature is reality. We live on, interact with, and exist on one planet. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can't export our pollution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, when you listen to some of the marketplace ideas, they really, we need a fundamental reordering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our survival, I think now you saw last year, I was screaming when I saw Australia. Yeah. You know, the whole side of the continent was on fire. Just on fire, yeah. And that gets, again, reduced or rendered to a two inch image mm -hmm. news clip. And we're more excited about what the pre you know the president of the United States spouted off right. you know, on Fox News or something, or yeah. they're given equal weight. And it's like we have a continent on fire. What part of this do you not? And then you have the government of Australia, of course, not able to give up those coal jobs, mm -hmm. even in the face of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And now you know how much attention has California really gotten? We have a whole West Coast on fire. Yeah. So this is duplicating. I'm drawing you back to Australia you to see that now it's somewhere else. It's but it's the same source that will alter all those people's lives. Use of water. How many millions of animals are perishing in those forests? Do you do you think serious? Yeah, no. Do you think sometime do you think that's like what your art sort of a message is? Like are you, would you say that your message is trying to memorialize this, as you say, like more than just a two by two or a, you know, a New York Times article or, you know, a picture on social media. Is this part of art trying to kind of... I think art's power mm -hmm. is to bring back, for an individual who was willing to go to the gallery and look, mm -hmm. the 
be intrigued. Hopefully they'll read my statement, but either way, they're they're going to pick up things. Oh, this little matches. You know, and when I showed not this work, but an earlier work where I had mounted the piece, not with copper nails, but with matches. Hmm on a burned wood platform. Gotcha. Um, it was amazing to me at the opening how many guys kind of soldered up to me and then said, uh, gee, I don't really like that match. And then I said, well, then you could burn everything. Wow. Right? Yeah. So it's the match is amazingly powerful vocabulary about mm. our intent. Sure, yeah. And as soon as you light it, it stops being. And the head of the match, if you look at any of these, like in number one or number three in the gallery, what's consistent through this whole series, there are now 11 completed, okay. uh, is that there is one match which head is not lit, and he is the voice, or they are the voice of the psalm. Mm. Oh, so that's the motif. Interesting. So for the psalms... One guy yeah. who still has his head. <laughs> oh yeah, literally, wow. <laughs> Right. I love to play all of my materials in my work throughout my life. The materials speak to the theme of the piece. Yeah, that's that is very interesting. That interaction and conversation between the actual art and then what it's made of. I've, that's so that's so fascinating. That's so neat. Wow. And you and you, that's something you you continuously have done. Is what you? Yeah. Yeah. You can go to, when you go through my website. You can look at earlier work and you can see like. Um, I got a piece I did back in 92 called 40 Wild Mules and an Acre of Dreams mm -hmm. that was built out of uh, wood that was burned in the LA riots. There were 160 hoof prints in gold from a federal mule named Molly, who was my participant in that piece. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> so all my work, um, yeah. Yeah, that's always been an element. I mean, it's mixed media painting, and drawing, but it's, it pulls in this reality. Yeah, no, that's that's that adds an, almost another layer. It's very layered, and then there's like a an, another one. <laughs> but uh, interesting. So, I guess also, so you've been kind of been doing this sort of thing for quite a while. Right. Um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in your art? Like what? What have you changed or shifted? I know it might be, that's kind of a very big question. And then also, what do you feel like has stayed similar throughout your art? You know, obviously you mentioned the the canvas pieces, but how, and like, how has like, I guess, his, since you're a history person, is, is that like a historical shift? Like, is it something to do with the times? Is it just like a personal thing? Like what, why, why are some things changing? Why are some things staying true for you? I think that, you know, painting and drawing is my foundation. So I'll use any media because I think art is anything you need it to be. Mm -hmm. But I like um, the the apps, the application of you know using real materials in time, um, and they do respond to issues you know throughout the years you know. But they have a certain kind because it's art. It has a certain kind of. It's not a bumper sticker. I mean, in the sense, I'm not doing pop art in that kind of immediacy on that level. That doesn't, for, for me, does not interest me. Okay. I'm interested in a longer view. Mm -hmm. um, and probably that has to do with that theology runs through my life. Um, my spiritual practice, I'm a Jew uh, by choice. And it's really, that's very important to me. That was part of my journey. Mm -hmm. So um, this latest work though, is um, crowdsourcing 2020. I really love them because it it harkens back to me into illuminated manuscripts mm -hmm. um, and that whole idea that these drawings you know, exist in that kind of format, telling a story. I think it is. It's really interesting to see how you make you draw inspiration from all these, like from the Psalms, very, very ancient, but still very relevant. Making those connections are it's very, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. But is there anything anywhere else you you really look for that story besides theology? You, you mentioned is there, and I guess nature also is something. Are those kind of your main like mountains? I can say that. Um... What I want to say is my spiritual or you know, theological practice and reading um, mm -hmm. is 
really frame the more the, <clears throat> the case of morality that I bring to the body politics. So I'm not interested. I mean, it's there are issues that are relevant, but then you know, then there's the healing in the community. So if you look at like Desmond Tutu, and you know, if you look at South Africa, um, the fact that they did truth t trials. Mm -hmm. All sides came together and simply told their story to each other. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't an idea of punishment, but it was about a reckoning. So I think there's, I'm very blessed. Um, our rabbi leads this song class that's been very important to me in COVID. Mm -hmm. So my congregation is Congregation Beth Santa Torah, which is, you know, it's all genders, all sexual orientations. Um, and rabbi, you know, we have an immigration clinic we run. There are huge things we do with incarceration. We have been working in the soup kitchens and eating. And there's a whole gamut of people that have done incredible things mm. uh, through these 30 years. And, you know, what I see in the Psalm study, which is very unusual, is that because we were all out of work, so it was like theater people, and music people, and all that, were in this group together. So it was like beyond graduate school. Wow having this like what do you think this means <laughs> that's lovely that's great it's such a yeah it was fabulous so i you know i'm very indebted so the the, the crowdsourcing has been my response to the class since i'm not a hmm. um, i'm not an ancient hebrew scholar <laughs> close <laughs> just, an, just an amateur <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so yeah so that's been fun i mean it's been really interesting have you shown people in that class your work at all? Or have yes. you They've asked for, uh, Rabbi has a thing after each psalm when we study it, she asked everybody to interpret the psalm for themselves. So various people have done remarkable work. Sure. And like, you know, people who write for theater, and, you know, people did songs and people did a dance. Uh, and I submitted a drawing. So that's for me. What was the response like from your peers? Uh, it was fascinating. They really gave good commentary because they were engaged. I mean, they could, they knew, yeah, yeah, they were really engaged. So, hmm. yeah, yeah, was I was, that's such a, yeah, it's such a neat. Did it, did that inform like newer works at all? Or was it just kind of like their commentary or their interpretations to that in, the, then inform you in future kind of pieces in the series or not really? Well, I think because the Psalms are tracking with the class. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, I can't, you know, but everybody's commentary. I mean, the way that everybody rewrote the song for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. So I, you know, yeah, it was an, an in-depth of a rich kind of intellectual and emotional experience with a lot of people who are on the front lines of, uh, mm -hmm. of COVID or other things. Right. It's remarkable. Yeah, that's such an interesting cross-section kind of, of interpretation almost. It's right. Hard. It's like we had a theater person call in from heard about the class because it's online. This is the news. Oh, so somebody called in who was like, I, think, I believe she was Italian, she was Catholic, but she called into our class because she heard about it yeah. from London. And then we have a gal from Bucharest who calls, who gets up in the middle of the night or whatever to join our class every day. And oh, she's wow. not Jewish. It's great. I mean, so that, you know, it's just open. Yeah, it's that's amazing. So we're now into the 26th week or whatever, and we have like 80 to 120 people in this thing. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so impactful. I can't imagine. That's, <laughs> that's great. Some historians, you know, it's like, you know, so it's been great fun. But I think it's, you know, anyway, that's just the way I feel. I am hoping my work nourishes the souls of people. Mm. What I most desire is to have someone have an aha moment. Mm. or emotionally or intellectually or some other way where um, for a moment they'll, you know, and if I'm real lucky, if I'm batting a thousand, then they'll, they'll consider their own agency. Mm. That, that's a really beautiful kind of message to, that's so, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, I guess the, 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 usually the final question, how I kind of wrap up um, and you sort of touched on it a bit with um, kind of how the pandemic has changed 
how, you know, like how your creative process or maybe how you view art or value art. And I think it's really interesting that you're talking about your class because if the pandemic wasn't going on, I would, I would assume that this person in Bucharest, this person in London, wouldn't have had access to this. So I guess that's a, that's a good thing. I guess a positive, you know, an opportunity. Um, but otherwise, how else have, have you seen major changes kind of with how you view art, your own art, or just in general? I would say this is that I felt the pandemic coming before it came. Hmm. Um, I don't believe, and I believe there will be more things, you know, it's like buckle your seatbelts <laughs> because you can't put as much plastic into the ocean that is affecting the fiber of every living thing. Hmm. Yeah. and not have the biosphere threatened. So we're not only have now reached 65% of animals are endangered, mm -hmm. we are wrecking havoc in the biosphere. Mm -hmm. So not to get theological, but I think it's useful to think of something besides yourself. <laughs> Generally, <laughs> yeah. Huh. And to think about your relationship to others, mm -hmm. to the planet, and to our furry friends. Of course. Um, I mean, just that they're drabbing at the last dregs of oil to go into the, there's been a few things we have held sacred, like, the, you know, up in, the, in, in Alaska to keep the conservation of the wild and, you know, they now want it for gas exploration. What part of this do you not understand? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think we need to have civil conversations because the political has become so frayed mm -hmm. that we need to uh, like start saying to people, we're talking about your being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking mm -hmm. existence. <laughs> Very personal level. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so I'm, I see art as being able to be transformative. And, it, you know, we are winning the revolution one person at a time. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, well, and okay. other people do other work, and God bless them. You know. yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I, I always like to end, I guess, on a positive note, even though I'd love to talk to you more. But um, thank you so much for your time and, and giving such great, lovely, honest, clear answers. If viewers who are watching this interview want to check out more of Noreen Dean Dresser's work, it's on our website, featured on our website, as well as her own website, which is her name, no, uh, no spaces.com. And also, I believe you mentioned you have a projection in Harlem for Art For Us on September 26th. So if you're welcome to check that out. <laughs>